What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ and Bucky back together. Buck, how are you doing, my friend? Man, I'm good, DJ. What's going on with you? Oh, I'm excited about today's episode, man. Uh, we've got a great guest. Uh, this is uh, this is an opportunity during this time of year. We get to kind of cherry pick guys we want to talk to, guys we're intrigued by. And this is one that we've talked about a lot over the last couple of years. Uh, it's Brian Hartline, a former NFL wide receiver, is the wide receivers coach at Ohio State University. Uh, where they have churned out one stud receiver after another, and the cupboard is still full, as we saw in the Rose Bowl last year, uh, with talented guys. So we want to pick his brain a little bit in terms of the evaluation process with wide receivers, as well as the development process uh, with wideouts. So that conversation is going to be coming your way in just a few minutes. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say about it all, because it's a position where you can put a great athlete out there and maybe have success, but the guys we talked about it. The guys who play for a long time and have a lot of success are the guys who are really skilled craftsmen on the perimeter. Guys who can run routes, guys who understand how to create separation, guys who not only have great hand-eye coordination, but they have tremendous ball skills. And some of that stuff is natural, but a lot of it is taught, and it takes great teachers to help those guys acquire those skills. Yeah, hopefully you guys will, will dig this conversation. We're all going to learn together. Um, I've got the pen and the paper ready as we do with these conversations. Buck, take some notes and uh, see what I can find out about uh, Coach Hartline, before we get to that conversation, though, I uh, wanted to pick your brain a little bit and let's chat it up on uh, on the wide receiver position. When you look around the league, uh, let's go to the guys that were, were rookies last year. So some second year wideouts. When you look at that list, Buck, are there some guys on there you're excited to see? Maybe this is kind of that breakout uh, that, that we're waiting for here. You're number two. Yeah. So let's go to the Baltimore Ravens and go to Rashad Bates. Uh, you know, when we think about the Baltimore Ravens, obviously we always think about Lamar Jackson and the running attack and what Lamar Jackson is going to do to impact that attack. I'm thinking about Rashad Bateman because he now will be the number one receiver there. Hollywood Brown is no longer there. They have a ton of tight ends in tow, but they don't necessarily have an established wide receiver. Well, last year they took him in the first round because they uh, maybe kind of had a foreshadowing that this would be the role that he would have. So now let's see how he steps into that number one role. And by being a number one in Baltimore, it doesn't need, mean that he has to have 80, 90 catches. I would think 50 to 60 catches for Rashad Bateman is a very realistic number. But if he's able to push that over 1,000 yards, to me, he's giving them exactly what they want, meaning big play production on limited opportunities. That's exactly how they need to complement the running game because I think they're going to go back to running the football and run it at will. Yeah, I think when you look at his uh, outlook for this year, I'm, the targets, I don't even really care about the targets, man. It's just going to be big, explosive plays. Like, you know, keep an eye on the number of plays over 30, 40 yards. I think he's going to be able to give them those. Um, I think they're going to get back to establishing that run, uh, be healthy along that the line of scrimmage, and then use those tight ends. And and then I think his role is going to be to pop some. Um, and sometimes those can even just be on slants, Buck. You get everybody jammed in there. Um, and just the RPO game, boom, shoot a slant out there and let him go. So uh, I'm with you on that one. I think he has a good year. I'm going to give you two names. Um, Elijah Moore, uh, we saw what he could do when he was healthy. He had a four or five game stretch last year. Remember that that game against Indianapolis mm -hmm. where he went off. Um, you're talking about a premier route runner. Year number two, not only for him in the system, year number two for Zach Wilson, the quarterback. They get a chance to, to work on that chemistry a little bit. Um, I just think he's a guy that can uncover. You keep Corey Davis healthy. You bring in some of these other weapons. Uh, Garrett Wilson, uh, as a rookie, be able to give them a, a little juice. You've got the running game should be better with the offensive line, hopefully healthy. You add in Brees Hall. Uh, I think Elijah Moore is poised for a big year. And then I'll go to the team that I see each and every week in Josh Palmer. Um, maybe mm. not kind of a household name, but we, we loved him going through the process. We talked about him at the Senior Bowl, how well he did there. Um, I remember during that draft evaluation, we talked about how he's one of the few guys that got Patrick Sertan. He's at, you know, he got him in that game, Tennessee, Alabama game last year when given opportunities to had some injuries, Mike Williams, Keenan Allen kind of in and out. I thought he stepped up and I think he's got a chance to kind of run uh, with that third wide out position there with the chargers. Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, you talked about those guys. There are two guys that I also bring up. How about the Yami Brown from Washington, the commander's second year player. He's a vertical playmaker that they may need. Everyone's going to pay attention to Terry McLaurin. You have Curtis Samuel. The Yami Brown could be a big play threat uh, for the commanders. And then Amari Rogers. He's kind of been the forgotten man in Green Bay. But when you look at the progression that they normally have with their wide receivers, it's normally the guy that is 
a third round pick who kind of starts out as a punt returner. He has some problems as a punt returner, but now I think he's more settled in. When you hear the talk coming out of Green Bay, there are people that are excited about the stuff that he's been able to do in the off season. I think he is someone to keep an eye on. He might be a very productive chain mover for the Packers as a number three receiver in that offense. All right, well, there you go. There's a couple of year two guys that were fired up up on uh speaking of fired up we are uh, extremely fired up for our guest here we teased it at the top uh let's not waste any time let's go ahead and bring him in here let's bring in brian hartline former nfl wide receiver and uh really kind of the caretaker of the top wide receiver program in the country i think you can make that case right now at ohio state here's our conversation with coach hartline all right buck we talked about it uh let's bring him in here uh coach we appreciate you taking some time and joining us today uh first of all man what you've got a killer uh you've got a killer tan working right now i need to know what you've been up to man. <laughs> so in the college world we get the the awesome opportunity to constantly do high school camps all summer in june so i'm outside uh coaching up guys really it's a great eval process but we've had a lot of camps outside a lot of work outside and any chance i get i go to the pool with my kids so um, I'm definitely working on my on my team here. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, coach, you you definitely have the bronze god working. Uh, you definitely look the part. But I'm curious about the high school camp. Is there anything that you can glean from watching a high school kid at camp under your tutelage? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the in person evals are critical. I think that you know, film can tell you one thing, but film can be a direct relation to sure their coachability and how they're coached and what the expectations are and and that changes from team to team. But to get your hands on with somebody and have them move, uh, I think that, you know, I like to pride myself. I, I think I know what it looks like. You know, I can kind of relate to it. I like to work with them to get their personality that you don't get on film. It's like texting versus talking on the phone. There's something you're getting from a communication standpoint in a phone call that you're not getting in a text. Same as film. So uh, to me, uh, in-person evals are critical. To be frank, to talk college ball, I mean, I've offered probably four or five, six guys just this summer alone by getting to work with them. So that in-person eval can be critical. Coach, I'm curious from your time playing, uh, you're a fantastic receiver there at Ohio State, you went on to the league. Uh, the the difference in the training for these kids versus what, you know, we're all similar age when we were coming up, just the 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 seven on seven stuff the year round. What, what is the positives in, in the difference with these kids now? And then maybe what's something that you think might be a negative? Well, I think that there's a lot of ball being played, which is a positive. I mean, anytime you're yeah. going out there and you're, you're throwing and catching, it's really great for, I would say, receivers and DBs more than anybody. Quarterback play can get a little hairy, you know, as far as reads and how that real life works with no rush and all that. And people out there in, like, you know, pajama pants and, like, all kinds of this. <laughs> stuff. So, so, to me, you know, I think that there's all kinds of stuff that goes on in the 707 world. That being said, anytime young men can compete, if you're finding that in track and field, I love it. If you find that, you know, in basketball, we love that. Anytime you can compete, that's important. So this competition is really awesome. Uh, it does open up a weird world of adults being involved. And when too many adults get involved, things can get hairy. That's just what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you can create bad habits a little bit. But I think that the positives outweigh the negatives at the end of the day, especially for these skilled athletes. Uh, in the seven-on-seven -seven world, they do get to develop. I don't know how you get the same development for like an O-line, D-line. That's the one thing that we see more than ever. I think trying to find the quality O-linemen, uh, it's just not a, you know, sexy position. You know, a lot of those D-linemen, I think they're D-linemen, they really should be playing O-line. And, and that development from the pass game perspective is there. But who are those run blockers? Who are So in a, in a college setting, uh, whenever, whenever there's a positive, like anything, there's always, a, you know, a drawback. Uh, but I think it's great for guys to compete. Uh, as far as the training goes, uh, a lot of guys, I think, are more advanced than ever. I think the game has been sped up. I think recruiting has been sped up. I think development has been sped up. And, uh, you know, that's really, really important. But what it takes to get to the NFL level hasn't changed. The work that it takes to get to the NFL level hasn't changed. Uh, it, it just feels like there's more of them from a receiver standpoint. Uh, the floor is a lot higher than it used to be. And uh, the skill set of these young athletes are just continuing to grow. You know, Coach, I got to ask you this because uh, I spent a lot of time coaching high school wide receivers on the tour, doing the stuff at the Elite 11 and opening and those things. And I think one of the biggest challenges for me as a coach is coaching guys that come in different sizes with different games. You have a little guy who is maybe ideally suited to be in the slot. 
Then the next rep, you may have a big body playmaker on the outside. For you at Ohio State, you guys have had all types come through there. Mm -hmm. How do you adjust your teaching when it comes to techniques when dealing with different types of players to get them all to maximize their potential? You know, I think that um, I really, for, uh, you know, refrain from ever pigeonholing a guy into this type of player. I think that at the NFL level, if you're not well-rounded, you're not going to make it. So, you know, it's amazing. And my, again, I really, my passion has always been the NFL. You know, the NFL is where I grew up. I wasn't a college fan. Like, so everything is geared towards that. The way I teach, the way I coach these guys, I am prepping them to be, you know, NFL players. You know, I'm not, we're not going to go to school for three or four years learn a degree and not be prepared to be a CEO. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So everything is prepped for that. So they do have different skill sets. They need to know who they are and they got to make sure they add to that because if you're not well-rounded, as soon as your coordinator gets fired or your head coach changes, you don't fit a system, then you have issues. And I think that at the end of the day, you may have different you know, size from a height perspective, but your catch radius better be off the charts. Your toughness better be off the charts. You should be able to do anything someone's asked you to do. And I understand, you know, you're not going to put a 5'10 kid on the backside of a 2 by one concept and, and isolate him. But he has to be able to do that at times. We get into, we get into 12 personnel. You want to make sure Jarvis Landry can go at the X and still win. I mean, that's going to happen. So mm -hmm. that's always been our mindset. And I think the guys really buy into that. I think that, uh, again, we make sure to recruit guys that we kind of, you know, kind of fit our mold. You know, there's some, mm -hmm. maybe some smaller guys that really just – could be great players, just not for us, which is okay. Mm. They can go somewhere else and be great players. So it's all that, you know what I mean? All that plays a part. Uh, but from a personality standpoint, from our room standpoint, I don't like being labeled. I was labeled and I mm -hmm. carry that with a chip. So, you know, if you ask any guy in my room, they can do anything you ask them to do. Coach, what do you want me to do? And then we want to train them that way. I'm curious, Coach, when you do uh, self-scout, one of the things you always do in scouting is we're always going back, trying to figure out why we got guys wrong, why we got guys right. And Bucky and I have been talking about this for a few years, and we kicked this around with Reggie Wayne a lot too. But when you kind of go through and look at the guys, maybe you under, you know, we personally maybe have undergraded over the years. We kept seeing these same words pop up over and over again: craftsman, polish. He's got tempo. He's got feel. And then you look at some of the guys you miss on more kind of straight line, fast guys um, that just didn't necessarily have all that. When you've looked at just the evaluation process before you get your hands on them to develop them, what are some of those lessons that you've learned over the years as an evaluator or recruiter? I would say that, you you know, you can't get mad at a guy that can't do something he can't do. All right. So mm -hmm. to me, I would say that, you know, the athletic side of things, the film side of things, that's more of a check the box. Like, mm -hmm. is he fast enough? Is he quick enough? Is he big enough? Is his frame enough? And then you go from there. I mean, you're talking about 16, 17 year old athletes. Now, what's not negotiable is their mental makeup. And what is that? Mm -hmm. What does that entail? I'm just telling you at the end of the day, I've never talked to a great athlete, a great wide receiver uh, in the NFL. And frankly, for lack of better words, they were dumb. Like mm -hmm. all of them can talk it. All of them can think it. It's all, this, it's a cerebral game. Your ability to take information and reapply it is critical. You know, we have a saying, you know, in our room, and, and this is kind of, again, it leads to that. Like it's all a mindset, right? It really is. Like when, so when I ask someone to raise their hand as high as they can, and then they raise it, and I ask, no, no, no as high as you can, and then it changes. Why don't we understand it the first time? And, mm -hmm. and to me, I think that, you know, again, we talk about man cover, right? And man cover to DB only plays as fast as the receiver, right? He only operates off the information we give him. Okay, so how do we give information? Everything is one from break point to catch point. How do we separate? How are we able to create separation to make the quarterback better, to make the O-line better? We're a trickle effect. So we spend so much time about the mental aspect of the game and our approach and what we're trying to get accomplished. Okay, did we accomplish it? If and through the recruiting process and the eval process, if you can't get a get a feel on that, um, it's the wrong fit, at least in our in our eyes, in my eyes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I want to ask you a follow up on that because yeah. I'm curious. Like, say you get and I, I have we we totally pay attention to the recruiting process for at the college level, but I'm sure you've got some guys that are probably already committed future players. Would you would you or even guys you're recruiting? Would you ever watch? you know, a game early in their high school season and maybe say, hey, I've noticed this, this, or this, you know, maybe you could make an adjustment. You're almost kind of coaching a kid before he even gets to you. Or I, I don't know if that's frowned upon. I don't know what the rules are there, but yeah. man, that's an idea to see if a kid can learn and adapt. To no, absolutely. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. I mean, so, so to me, those guys thrive on that. And frankly, mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the feedback is the dialogue we give is a lot different than others. And that kind of separates mm -hmm. us, to be honest. So like, 
but no, I agree with you. I think that uh, I don't always say that and give a direct response. My first question it always is, why'd you do that? Because okay. if they don't know why they did it, they're just being a baller. They don't have any idea. To me, <laughs> I don't I don't care that you can do it. It's about how often you can do it. If you don't know why it's yeah. good, it probably won't show up again. It's a coin flip. So yeah. <laughs> we spend as much time as we can identifying the good, but also reinforcing why it's good. Hold on. Awesome route. Great inside release. Do you understand why that positioned the guy there? If they know mm -hmm. that, good chance is going to happen again. And if, that, if they know that, then the negatives or the not so goods don't show up. So mm -hmm. I, we spend so much time on the positivity of why it was good because I want to see more of that. If you just say, hey, man, great route. That's all I got when I was, when I was a player. I caught a ball. I got like, oh, man, great route. I'm like, oh, actually, that was a crap route. But I was productive, so that's all you can tell me. So, like, yeah. I, I really, really, really enforce, like, why it was good. Because if they know why, it'll happen more often. If they don't know why, it's a coin flip. And, and, and the more times they know why, the, again, the, 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 the mistakes, the MAs just go by the wayside because mm -hmm. you're really focusing on why it was a good rep. That makes sense. So I did the same yeah. thing with the high school kids. Hey, do you know why that was good? Honestly, coach, I have no idea. I'm like, okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> Let me explain to you why. Yeah. And then we go from there. You know, Brian, I, I really love what I'm hearing. And I have to ask you this because as a longtime player, I'm curious because you're so detailed and dialed in and can give me the whys behind it. Who influenced you the most in terms of you learning how to take information like that and you learning how to give information like that? Because that is uncommon in my experience. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, and, and, and so in retrospect, first answer is going to be Daryl Hazel. Coach Hazel was the receiver coach here, uh, you know, when I was here, fortunate enough to have him all four of my years. And I'll get, it's, it's funny. But then I think, frankly, you know, that I kind of developed along my, on my own path. I think I was being a player. And, and frankly, I've had coaches that, you know, I was very under, underwhelmed with at times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, guys like Jarvis Landry and Brandon Marshall, and Mike Wallace, and Brandon Gibson, and Greg Camarillo, like we would be coaching ourselves. But I was very, I'm very opinionated. So I think I, I, it just developed over time. Honestly, we were coaching each other. We were. And there's nothing better than peer-to-peer -peer learning. There isn't. And uh, so I learned a lot from Coach Hazel. I learned a lot from Jarvis Landry and Brandon Marshall. He's learned from me. And we learned a lot from each other. And I think over time, it just continued to develop. I'm now a coach for five years. And I've learned so much just grabbing, you know, refining my, my belief. And, you know, and, and, and so I guess I don't have a great answer for you, but I know that Coach Hazel uh, really changed my life. And I owe a lot to him. He went on to be uh, the Kent State head coach and the Purdue head coach. And he was up there with Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen for a while in Minnesota. Did a phen I mean, he's a phenomenal coach. And he always told me, hey, man, coach, when I'm 55, I'm done. I'm with my kids. And that dude turned 55, and he just hit it. Like, <laughs> so, you know, he, he, uh, he's down in Cincinnati now, but he, he really, like, changed my life. And so it's funny because I'll come back, you know, how I am. Like, I thought it was one way, and it wasn't. I was like, hey, coach, I teach just like you did, like this, this, this. And he looked at me like, Yo, heart, like I didn't teach that. I was just teaching like this and this. And I was like, you added that. I was like, I see. I just warped it on my head. You know what I mean? And like, so it's been a combination of so much. And frankly, I watch on Instagram and I, I, I would do like, I talk yeah. to guys all the time. I just want to learn so I can pass on to others. And uh, I don't know. I didn't realize that was happening in my life. I thought I was a player, but now I realize like went through that path to hopefully be where I'm at today. So that's no, a long-winded that's... answer, but that's kind of the guys that have kind of shaped it over the years. Well, see, I, no, that was fantastic information, but I was having PTSD on Greg Camarillo because that's, uh, that's a myth in my past. He had the freaking best three-coner, like short shuttle at the Stanford Pro Day. He didn't have a ton of production at Stanford. Yeah. I was like, ah, oh, this guy. Well, we get to the Pro Day. He put on a show, and I was, I was with the Ravens, I believe, at the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were very much tape-related production you know, and make up in that. And then we didn't, we tried not to get carried away with pro days. And then after that, I was like, I don't know, man, dude tears up the shuttles like this again. Like I'm not, I'm not making that mistake twice. Yeah. went on and had a heck of a, a productive career, yeah. man, but the change of direction was off the charts. Again, the, and the common, the common themes, themes is those, uh, the cerebral mental approach, the mental makeup, man. Just every time I talk to, you know, if it's, whether it's Ocho or B Marsh or like, it's just, it's all, it's all linked. Like, they all sound the same. They can talk it. If you can't, there's just something there, you know, and again, we're not saying it's concrete. It's odds mm -hmm. of success, right? Mm -hmm. how, how do I improve my odds of success? 40 yard time. Okay. Elkhorn. Okay. Pro agility. Not saying it's one or the other. It's just your odds of success 
And the more you do that, the more chances it's going to happen. Uh, I want to talk about a couple guys you put out uh, last year. It was a heck of a year for you uh, with, with really three guys you had your hands on that, that uh, found their way at the top of the draft. Let, let's start here uh, with Garrett Wilson. I want you just on these guys, coach, if I was going to say, why is he going to be successful? What would your answer be? Let's start with Garrett Wilson. You know, Garrett Wilson, uh, I mean, wow, what a maturation. I mean, he came in as an athlete. I mean, a heck of an athlete. I mean, maybe the best I've ever seen. And, uh, but his ability to grow, like we said, in the mental makeup of the game is critical. And I think if you asked him, he'd probably tell you the same thing. Uh, so to me, you know, he has all of the skill sets. All right. So it's going to come down to, you know, continuing that, 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 that consistency, right? I mean, it's not if you can do it, it's how often. So yeah. as long as he continues to grow in that facet, and again, just like all athletes, not just Garrett Wilson, but like when you show up, you got to understand, I always say it's like Mario Kart. You know, it's like mm -hmm. the race ain't done. You just hit a checkpoint. Yeah. So like yeah. if you hit his checkpoint, now we got to grow from here. How much can I grow from here to continue on that path? Because the path and trajectory he's on from his freshman year to his junior year is just off the charts. So can he learn from the guys around him? Can he get with this quarterback? Can he maintain a great lifestyle he already lives, you know? And, mm -hmm. and to me, when everything changes, when your surroundings change, it's more about can I stay on my path? So mm -hmm. if G5 can just stay on the path he's on and continue to, you know, add to that path, I mean, the sky's the limit. So if he's – the answer to your question is he's going to be successful if mm -hmm. he stays on the path he's on. That's what I would say. Perfect. All right, let's go to, let's go to Olave. Uh, Chris, I mean – really is as consistent as you come. I mean, mm -hmm. when you put on the film, it's not necessarily a violent film and outside your body film and, and hard movement film. It's just smooth and consistent. And, you know, as a quarterback, you know where he's going to be and when he's supposed to be there. Uh, personality wise, he's quiet. Like he's, he, he knows how to be a pro just like Garrett. So these guys have a lot in common to where they're at. I think that, you know, Chris is just a year older. So he's kind of, you know, provided that extra year of learning and growing, uh, but, you know, I just think I know as a quarterback, I think that at the end of the day, a lot of guys do different things uh, and Chris can do it all. I mean, again, it's not going to be flashy, but he's going to he's going to sell the heck out of that go ball or run that comeback. And no one's going to be on him. He's going to create uncontested catches for you. And it's going to be a routes on air mentality. So, uh, again, not to sound uh, you know, repetitive, but these guys just stay on the path they're on. In my opinion, they uh they're destined for success. And then again, it's, it's how long they can do it, right? The NFL, we know not for long, but it comes down to taking care of our bodies and, and, and operating at the, at, at the level they're already operating at. So, so, so my Olave story, uh, he was, I'm a San Diego guy. He grew up out here. So uh, they have a, a prep pigskin award or something. It's like for the top football player in San Diego County. So they had uh, me and uh, Telesco, Tom Telesco, the GM of the Chargers, were two of the guys that had to vote, vote on this thing. So we, we do it independent of each other. We kind of send in who it was. Well, one of the nominees was the quarterback. I think it was Jack Tuttle uh, yeah. was the quarterback at his high school. So I, I see Telesco, you know, after this thing, and I go, hey, who did you vote for? He goes, well, the, the best guy that I saw wasn't even nominated. I'm like, the receiver that was with the other quarterback, right? He's like, yes. I'm like, I don't know who this kid is, but that kid's the best player of any of these guys that we were, we were looking at for this award. Uh, but man, what a find uh, for you guys to go out to California and pluck. And how'd you get, how'd you get that eval? Was it off a of film? Yeah, we watched film. So yeah, we oh, just watched okay. the film. I like, thought it was oh, more from the in-person eval because like never even, he never didn't even, have a junior year. Yeah. So this is, so this is going back. Gosh. So this would have been, was this his senior year? It had to be. So, so yeah. it's a scene. Yeah. So his, yeah. it's for the top senior player or whatever oh, in, gotcha. the, in the country. Gotcha. And so that was it. We watching, saw it too. We were actually out there. crap. This kid's fast, man. Yeah, I'm sorry. But, yeah, we were out there to recruit the quarterback, and that's kind of how it all linked up because he didn't play his yeah. senior year. Uh, I was not the receiver coach at the time, and I remember mm -hmm. watching his film uh, kind of pushed, hey, Hart, just check it out. You know, we have these guys kind of in the boat. You know, where does he stack up? And I was like, frankly, I was like, man, he's the best one, <laughs> hands down. He goes, and, you know, yeah, I thought so too. I was like, yeah. So uh, we went down that road and blessed that he came here. And then by the time he showed up in June, because he was a normal arrival, um, I got I, – I started the receiver – job uh you know july or so so he was about a month a month out and uh yeah so his first year was my first year yeah i mean he just he's one of those guys and, and again you, you take it with a grain of salt it's a high school field but when the guy looks he's just operating at a totally different speed than everybody else out there and just had total control of his body but I mean, he was yep. uh he was fun and uh, that was his route, and that was oh, yeah. right the route tree just needed to be developed and yeah 
you definitely put the time in to do that. So, yeah. And then uh, I remember flipping on, gosh, it's a Saturday out here, probably one of those 9 a.m. Uh, West Coasters uh, for, for a Big Ten game. And I remember uh, maybe it was Michigan or one of his games his freshman year. I saw him block. It, was. Blocked it would have been yeah. Michigan. It would have been Tilt yeah. North because, like, yep. you know, for that, um, he was a June guy. So it took a little mm-hmm. more time to kind of get rolling. But he yeah. started really being an attribute uh, to our team uh, towards the end of the year. Yep. Yeah, I remember because I do the I do the Charger games and and yep. uh, and Tom and I have said that's that's the guy we were talking about. Like he should have won that the, the prep pigskin award back yep. back uh, the year before. Uh, last one, Jameson Williams. You had your hands on him mm-hmm. uh, before he goes to Alabama. Has an unbelievable year before that unfortunate injury. Uh, still goes in the first round of the Detroit Lions. Um, just you know what you saw from him, and you talk about kind of the trajectory line. Did you oh, yeah. see that coming? That that train oh, yeah, is coming down the tracks. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, not to dive into like the conversations we had, but we're just in a spot, you know, where, and again, he was that. So he came in in June as well, um, spent, you know, the first two years of his career with us. And then, you know, uh, in June, headed down to uh, Alabama. And and really at the end of the day, it was just, you know, one of those things where we have Jackson Smith and Jigbo where we haven't really yeah. talked a lot about, which is fine. But you're going to talk <laughs> about him pretty quick here now. And yeah. we just had honest conversations in the spring. Long, long story short, it just kind of was a, you know, sometimes, you know, there's pressures to be and I really want to put myself in a position to be a three, three year and out kind of guy. And, you know, it was just one of those conversations where, like, listen, man, like, I don't know if I can guarantee you that right now. Uh, but if you're here and graduate your fourth year, you're going to reach all of your dreams. You're going to be a top 15 mm-hmm. guy. I know what you, you know, what you're capable. Of. Anyways, not to divulge into that, but it was, yeah. uh, I, I thought barely highly of him. Like, I love JMO and mm-hmm. um, he knows that. And I did, you know, we did everything we could to make sure he was successful and everything he accomplished, man, I'm so happy for him and his family, right? Uh, just saw it though, high hip, longer gait. He came mm-hmm. in, could really run. He was a hurdler and a little bit and uh, ran track. And I fell in love with him when, you know, that fall on my first fall. And uh, uh, he had a little bit of a development from a route perspective, just cause he's high hipped and long. So he mm-hmm. had to kind of work through that, did a phenomenal job, had a great spring uh, before he headed south. And uh, but I have the most love there is for JMO. I remember talking, uh, frankly, with Detroit and just about how much I thought of JMO. And uh, and I think that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, everything he's received and has done well, well deserved. I mean, mm-hmm. what a heck of a player. So you- I think for him to remain successful, it'll just be the consistency level. I really and not to be a broken record, but it always comes yeah. down to that. You know, he had a great, great year down in South and uh, now do it again. And then do it again. And then don't get bored and think you've arrived, just like every athlete, uh, once you have a good year. But that guy's a ball guy. He is he loves to compete. He loves to practice. So he has the makeup of being a guy that can play football for a long time in the NFL. Now, Ted, Teddy Ginn was before you at Ohio yeah, State, Yeah, two right? years before. Yep. But just like in terms of like you talk about high hip, straight line, big time yeah. juice, like that that was my kind of comparison for him going through the comparison. process. I yeah. think that, you know, I told Teddy, hey, man, I think I think our route development was a little better than, than his. But no, I mean, all kidding, all kidding aside, there's, there's no doubt. There's a comparison there. He, he yeah. knows. And again, me and Teddy are like this. We ran track against each other in high school. Um, yeah. But I think J-Mo developed into one heck of a route runner. And uh, I think he's done a phenomenal job. And I'm a fan for life. So um, I know he was back in town with the boys probably a week ago or so. But, you know, he uh, anyways, biggest fan. I can't wait to watch what he does in Detroit. Hey, Coach, this has been fun, man. I appreciate all your time uh, being generous with us today. We always like when we get guys that are doing good work and get a chance to fill up a, note, a, a notebook here of, uh, of good stuff, help us get better at what we do. So we appreciate your time, man. Best of luck. I know I did see a little thing. I did a little homework. I did see you already crushing and recruiting. So the pipeline's <laughs> full. You lose all these You lose all these guys, you go to the Rose Bowl. I talked to, to Pantone, who's, who's in charge yeah. of their running recruiting, and he's like, dude, We'll be okay. And I was like, really? This is yeah. some studs you're losing. I turned on the Rose Bowl. I was like, yeah, you guys are fine. <laughs> it was special now. We kind of – we've created a, a room where it's NFL-like, and these guys are learning from each other. You know, like I said, mm-hmm. like peer-to-peer pressure to learn. I don't care if you learn it from me or you learn it from Gary Wilson. You surround yourself with the best, you're going to become the best. Well, you're doing a heck of a job, man, and your reputation is continuing to grow at the NFL level as well, and we're excited to follow your career as you, as you move along. Best of luck. Over the rest of the summer, as you guys kick it off this fall, appreciate you, man. Yeah, I love talking to you guys. See you guys. 
All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation uh, as much as we did. So awesome to catch up with Brian Hartline. Again, I don't know if you can find a, a better developer of wideouts right now in football. He's just done a phenomenal job, not only identifying good players, recruiting them, but really the more importantly, uh, developing them and uh, adding nuance to their game. And as he mentioned, finding the right the right makeup, the right cerebral makeup with these guys and just and just giving them information. Uh, he's done a phenomenal job. And uh, again, very generous with his time today. We appreciate that. Hope you guys have enjoyed the show as much as we have. And uh, we'll catch you next time right here on Moving the Sticks.